breast milk science. It's a thing, and it's our thing. We're by heart. Our mission is simple. Make the best infant formula in the world. We partnered with breast milk scientists, world-class doctors, and passionate parents to write a new recipe from scratch. And while we put a lot into by heart, there's a long list of things you won't see on our ingredient list, like corn syrup, soy, or palm oil. Curious if by heart is right for your baby? New customers can shop the starter pack and get two cans for the price of one at byheart.com slash get started. This is a limited time offer. Additional terms and conditions apply. Just because breastfeeding is natural doesn't mean it's easy. But you don't have to do it alone. That's where the Lactation Network comes in. The Lactation Network helps parents at every stage of the breastfeeding journey. Whether you need support resolving feeding issues, choosing the right breast pump, creating a plan for weaning, or anything in between. The Lactation Network is the largest network of licensed breastfeeding experts in the country. They provide in-home, in-office, and telehealth consultations in all 50 states with no out-of-pocket cost. Get the breastfeeding care you deserve with the Lactation Network. Visit tln.care slash podcast to schedule your own insurance-covered lactation consultation today. Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. Today's episode chose me. Just kind of came out of left field last week, and my Aries butt was like, oh, a perfectly pre planned episode or this shiny thing. I squirreled so hard, guys. Um, we are diving into a case today that you guys are probably already familiar with, but I'm not. I wasn't. Uh, and this one was just a jaw dropper for me. It, it is so perplexing and so involved and so intriguing. In that case, dear listeners, is the Lake and Heath Bentwaters incident of 1956. Now, the version of events that I will be including today primarily come from two sources. The first is a report published in the Flying Saucer Review in 1970 and written by Dr. James McDonald, who was a professor of atmospheric sciences for almost 20 years at the University of Arizona's Institute of Atmospheric Physics. This report is titled UFOs over Lake and Heath in 1956 and is based on a lecture that Dr. McDonald gave the previous year. The other is a sample case selected by the UFO subcommittee of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics by G.D. Thayer and published in 1971. This document is simply called UFO Encounter 2 and can be found online at CIA.gov. A quick word from our sponsor, and then we are going to dive into it. Spring has sprung, and our friends at Manscaped have the best tools for some spring cleaning. They've already helped men everywhere tidy up all the nooks and crannies of their body's basement. But this year, Manscaped can help them get the perfect presentation on that beautiful face with the new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Make sure you look your best this spring by using code PNG to get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Guys, it is time to tame your mane with the help of the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. The sun is just starting to peek back out, which means you will ultimately, inevitably, have to show your face in the daylight again. Use the kit to make sure your scruff looks award-winning, whether you go glorious flowing beard or smooth, sleek cheeks. The choice is yours, gentlemen. But the cherry on top of your taming game, the chef's kiss 
to your luscious face locks is the Manscaped Beard Balm. This pomade shapes, styles, moisturizes, all with the scent of eucalyptus, rosemary, and lavender. Lee's beard has been extra snort-worthy. He smells very, very good. <laughs> so save 20% off and free shipping with the code PNG at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code PNG at manscaped.com. Focus on the face and use the Beard Hedger Pro Kit for the cleanest look in the game. Fair warning, if you are not already familiar with this case, it is a hard one to follow. There are a lot of times of events, multiple witnesses, multiple vantage points and observance points, and numerous anomalous activity taking place, all within the span of about six hours. So bear with me. Let's get into it. It began on the evening of August 13th, 1956. At 9.30 p.m., a Bentwaters ground control radar operator reported picking up a target 25 to 30 miles southeast of him, moving at a very high speed across his scope over Bentwaters until he lost it 15 to 20 miles northwest of him. Blue Book says this operator described the target giving off a strong radar echo. The size of the blip when picked up was that of a normal aircraft target, before weakening at the end when he lost sight of it when it vanished. The operator estimated the thing to be moving at about 4,000 miles per hour, however, a transit time of approximately 30 seconds from start to finish, covering the object's entire range of 40 to 50 miles, would have put it moving anywhere from 5 to 6,000 miles per hour. No matter the discrepancy of the speed, it was moving faster than any conventional aircraft at the time and slower than any meteor. Keep that in mind because we are going to be talking about the meteor debate in just a bit. The next event takes place over the course of 20 minutes, traversing 58 miles across the scope. So five minutes after the first object had appeared, at 9.35 p.m., a group of about 12 to 15 blips that gave off normal echoes, looked like normal targets on screen, appeared eight miles southwest of Bentwaters. These targets moved in a cohesive group, taking up a six to seven mile area of space as they moved together in a northeast direction. At this point, normal checks were made to determine any possible malfunction of the ground control radar, which failed to indicate anything was technically wrong. They were capturing something on radar. They continued to watch this group fly northeast over Bentwaters, described in the Blue Book file as being preceded by three of the objects in a distinctly triangular formation, with the remainder of the group scattered behind the lead formation at irregular levels. Now, I imagine everyone at ground control all sitting around eating their popcorn because what happened next? Dudes. So they watch this group as it continues northeast, reporting the intensity of each individual echo decreasing. At about 40 miles northeast, the group of 12 to 15 seemed to converge to form one single radar echo with an intensity that was described as several times larger than that of a B-36 under the same conditions. And you know what this converged object did next? You really want to know? Nothing. It did absolutely nothing. Just sat there, stationary, <laughs> for 10 to 15 minutes. Just chilling, you know, taking a breather. You, you know how UFOs be. Dude, I'd be choking on my popcorn at this point. All right. So 10 to 15 minutes later, the object was like, okay, okay we good, and continues on its way. Continued heading on its northeast path for another five to six miles. And then was like, huh, just kidding, and stops again <laughs> for, for about three to five minutes before finally continuing its forward motion and disappearing off the edge of the radar scope at 9.55 p.m. Let's talk about the speed of this group thing. So, the original operator eyeballing the anomaly estimated to be moving anywhere from 80 to 125 miles per hour. 
But G.D. Thayer relayed in his report the speed could have been anywhere from 290 to 700 miles per hour. Because math. It's quite a difference. Possibly an experimental craft? Mm, uh, aside from the, uh, the, the morphing into a hovering transformer, sure, okay. Five minutes later, at 10 o'clock, another target was detected 30 miles east of Bentwaters and was tracked about 25 miles west of their station when it disappeared off the radar. The target covered that 55-mile distance in 16 seconds, indicating a speed of 12,000 miles per hour. These three events at Bentwaters were curiously omitted from the Condon report, even though, according to Dr. McDonald, uh, they, they were uh, received quite a bit of attention in the Blue Book file. The Condon report actually focused on the events over at Lakenheath, uh, which got a lot less play in the Blue Book file, from which they supposedly were deducing their findings. I don't know, just kind of weird. Right. <laughs> so Bentwaters, all out of popcorn uh, after this third target, luckily wouldn't see anything else until 10.55 p.m. When yet another high speed target estimated to be moving anywhere from two to four thousand miles per hour was detected again at 30 miles east of their station and heading due west, passing right over them and disappearing from scope 30 miles west of Bentwaters. Now, arguments were made that this reading was nothing more than anomalous propagation due to it disappearing for a span of about five miles right as it crossed over Bentwaters, aka that, that access point of their spinning radar. Anomalous propagation is a false radar echo that as I understand it, uh, has something to do with temperature inversions that direct the radar beam to the ground and the reflection it shoots back, giving you a false target uh, that, that would appear at twice the range and twice the height of the reflecting layer. So that would totally make sense. And I understand how that disappearance of a false target would occur right in that blind spot uh, of a spinning circular radar setup like that. However, anomalous propagation likes to move with the wind. And in this case, the target moved quickly, almost opposite to the prevailing winds that night. Um, and there was also something very unusual and very special about this fourth event. Eyewitnesses. Someone at the control tower at Bentwaters reported seeing a bright light passing over the field from east to west at terrific speed at about 4,000 feet altitude. So someone in the control tower was looking up, saw this light with their eyeballs, and uh, yeah. Now this, this operator overestimated the height of this thing because concurrently a C-47 aircraft flying over the station at the time was himself sitting at 4,000 feet altitude and reported a bright light streaked under his aircraft traveling east to west at terrific speed. Something... Dr. McDonald noted in his write-up was that there was no sonic boom reported for this high speed, uh, again estimated by radar control to have been uh, 2,000 to 4,000 miles per hour, which should have been more than enough to have created one. But also as fast as this light was, still not fast enough to have been a meteor. So Moving on, it was at this point uh, that all of this info was relayed to the watch supervisor over at Lake and Heath's Radar Air Traffic Control Center, which is located about 40 miles northwest of Bentwaters, with a call and a question that I imagine went something along the lines of, oh, hello, Lake and Heath, um, do you perchance have any 4,000 mile per hour targets over there or nah because we kind of got this whole war of the worlds thing happening on our end so we were just curious okay bye <laughs> as uh skeptical as someone might be receiving a call like this it is reported 
that the Lake and Heath watch supervisor immediately had all controllers start scanning the radar scopes using full MTI, or moving target indicator, which eliminated entirely all ground returns on the radar. So you uh, wouldn't be picking up any false readings of large buildings or any other motionless object. Hello, my name is Jordan Klein, and I am the host of Fireside Paranormal Podcast. If you're into ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, the unknown, then pull up a chair and join me by the fire as we hear real stories from real people. Each episode, I interview paranormal investigators, authors, experts, and legends in their field. Here at Fireside Paranormal Podcast, we have something for everyone. If you're an experienced researcher, or if you're just getting into it, we have a spot for you. We're found anywhere you listen to podcasts. So grab your friends, tune in, and remember, don't be afraid, only believe. Our fifth event takes place shortly after their search began, when one of the Lake and Heath air traffic controllers picked up a stationary target 20 to 25 miles southwest of them. And if you are able to look at the map included in G.D. Thayer's document, you'll see uh, clearly where they spotted it. And strangely enough, it almost lines up like in direct line with that fourth target that Bent Waters had reported was heading their way. Now, here's something fun. MTI should have eliminated anything moving less than 40 to 50 knots. But staring at the radar screen, the operators could not detect any movement whatsoever while the MTI is still showing something is there. So it must have been making some kind of movement, you know, maybe vibrations, rotations, I don't know. It's a curious reading, though. Lake and Heath's air traffic control reached out to Lake and Heath's ground control to see if they had the same target on their scopes. And the answer is yes. Yes, they did. They confirmed the target was on their scope in the same location, which is important in itself because RATCC and ground control were using two different radar systems, different wavelengths, different pulse repetition frequencies, and different scan rates, which tend to rule out certain radar anomaly hypotheses such as interference echoes from distant radar and our friend, anomalous propagation. Radar air control personnel report continuing to watch this stationary anomaly when it suddenly began to move in a stop-and-go motion in a northeast direction toward Lake and Heath. In a letter written 11 years after the fact, and submitted to the Condon Committee, and also matched the 1956 intelligence report that was submitted by the Lake and Heath unit following the event. The supervisor from that night recounts, the target made several changes in location, always in a straight line, always at about 600 miles per hour, and always from a standing or stationary point to his next stop at constant speed. No build-up in speed at all. The changes in location varied from 8 miles to 20 miles in length. No set pattern at any time. Time spent stationary between movements also varied from 3 to 6 minutes. And the object was also reported to have completely reversed its course at times. Another target was spotted on radar about 17 miles east of the station, while that initial target would be some 20 miles north-northwest of Lake and Heath before a fighter jet was scrambled up there to investigate. More on that in a moment. Let's rewind for a second. Um, An officer recording this span of time in the original Blue Book file uh, made some interesting statements, the first being two radar sets— the ground control and the RATCC, and three ground observers report substantially the same. And his second statement, the fact that radar and ground visual observations were made on its rapid acceleration and abrupt stops certainly lends credence to this report. Why did he make those statements? Because this activity was observed with multiple pairs of eyeballs. Uh, in addition to the two radar systems. Now, there were 
multiple visual accounts of uh, the activities taking place at Lake and Heath that night. One witness report included in Project Blue Book describes the size of the light witnessed to be about the size of a golf ball held at arm's length upon first observation and reducing to that of a pinpoint as it continued in flight. There was another ground observer report of two luminous lights flying in and merging into one before flying away, but that one doesn't seem to have been seen on radar. Um, It it might have been, but this whole part of the story is really rough to understand. Um, But what we've already heard is pretty spectacular. I only included that last standalone observation uh, because this is where we are going to talk about meteors. So the date this entire incident took place coincided with the date of the peak frequency of the Perseid meteors. And it has been suggested that any one of the ground observers could have simply been mistaking a meteor for a UFO. Because we can already rule out any of the radar readings. They were they were moving too slow, right? Okay. The Lake and Heath report to Blue Book notes that the ground observers had reported unusual amounts of shooting stars in the sky, indicating that the lights they were seeing were readily distinguishable from meteors. The report further remarks that the objects seen were definitely not shooting stars as there were no trails as are usual with such sightings. Additionally, the sudden stopping and course reversals of said lights witnessed is incompatible with meteor behavior. And finally, the description of a light the size of a golf ball rules it out as a Perseid since that shower yields only meteors of very low luminosity. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Man, is this not the most chaotic night you could imagine? I mean, they got meteor showers and unidentified targets just appearing and disappearing off their radar. Uh, People on the ground talking about golf ball lights, uh, targets bebopping around like ping pong balls. (laughs) What is going on? And uh, moving like ping pong balls, objects that move like ping pong balls. What does that remind you of? Hmm. All right, back to the story. Sometime around midnight, a jet was scrambled from the Water Beach Royal Air Force Station to investigate. The jet interceptor was a Venom single-seat subsonic aircraft equipped with an air intercept nose radar. Sounds fancy. By the time the jet got up there, Lake and Heath radar had one of the unidentified targets still on their scope, six miles east of them, to which the pilot was vectored. According to the intelligence report, the pilot flew over Lake and Heath toward his target and then advised that he had a bright white light in sight and would investigate. At 13 miles east, he reported he had lost the target off radar and lost visual of the white light. The original report goes on to note that after the pilot had lost both visual and radar on the target, air traffic control then vectored him to a target 10 miles east of Lake and Heath. And when the pilot got there, he advised that the target was on radar and he was locking on. As the pilot neared the unknown target, he lost his lock on it. There was a brief pause after the pilot said he had gun lock on the object before he said, where did he go? Do you still have him? Talking to the radar controllers at Lake and Heath. Air traffic control watched on radar as the pilot passed whatever it was, and whatever it was, began to chase the pilot. (laughs) When control radioed the pilot to acknowledge this turn of events, it is assumed that he did acknowledge it when he replied that he would try to circle and get behind the target. And boy, did he try. The supervisor's letter that I mentioned before that McDonald uh, references went on to say that he climbed, dived, circled, etc., but the UFO acted like it was glued right behind him, always the same distance, very close, but we always had two distinct targets. The pilot would advise that he was unable to shake the target off his tail and requested assistance. The supervisor estimated this chase lasting about 10 minutes before the pilot, unable to shake the object and sounding pretty scared, 
radioed that he was running low on fuel and opted to return to the Water Beach station. According to the supervisor's letter, the target appeared to follow the Venom a short distance as the pilot headed southwest toward Water Beach, and then it resumed a stationary aspect. A second Venom would be scrambled, however, would have to return after only a short time due to an engine malfunction. A short conversation between the two pilots was monitored by Lake and Heath watch supervisor with the second pilot asking, did you see anything? The first pilot says, I saw something, but I'll be damned if I know what it was. Number two asks what happened. And number one goes, he or it got behind me and I did everything I could to get behind him and I couldn't. It's the damnedest thing I've ever seen. And that first pilot would later tell Air Force investigators that this was the clearest target that he had ever seen on radar. Then it's reported that after the commotion, the uh, object would go on to make more short moves uh, before leaving Lake and Heath's radar heading north. And the Blue Book file sets the final radar sighting at 3.30 a.m., Does this incident not kick major ass, you guys? I might have gotten carried away a little bit with the uh, this more dramatic rendition of this event. I will admit that. That's fine. I know the likelihood that all of the transmissions and and things that were said may not have been said in those ways or, or said at all. And I know that witness testimony can be fallible. I know that this happened a long time ago and records have been lost and and details exaggerated. I, I, I get all of that. I do. But if the basic story stands, you know, if if the bare bones of this story stand, this is one heck of a case. Um, my skeptical allowance on this comes from reading blog articles by Dr. David Clark, who, from what I've read thus far, he is one hell of a researcher. And he does have a different take on the Lake and Heath and Bentwaters incident. And uh, and it's, it's certainly not so dramatic. And he does supply additional possible explanations than were even offered up by the Condon Report and by various skeptical researchers at the time. And I would encourage anyone out there with an open mind uh, to to take a look at what he had to say. I will say, though, even though I have read what he wrote about it, I still lean kind of favorably toward the idea that this is still an unexplainable case in its totality. Uh, there were just too many unknowns, too many eyes on these things. I think I have to agree with the Condon Report in in one respect at least. Um, And the Condon Report ultimately found this case to be one of their unexplainables. In their analysis, they stated, in conclusion, although conventional or natural explanations certainly cannot be ruled out, the probability of such seems low in this case, and the probability that at least one genuine UFO was involved appears to be fairly high. Looking into this case has has led into some really interesting thoughts, avenues of thought on the subject. Uh, Number one, what the hell was going on over in this area of the UK? Like Lake and Heath and Bentwaters is located in an area uh, referred to as the Welsh Triangle, which is an area that has had more than its fair share of inexplicable, unexplainable aerial phenomena. So in the 60s, there was a flap in Warminster, which was already considered a UFO hotspot. The people heard hammering noises coming from the sky, so powerful their houses would shake. They saw numerous anomalous lights in the sky. And this became so common an occurrence, uh, the, the whole ordeal was combined and named the Warminster Thing. In the 70s, there was a UFO sighting in Broadhaven, very reminiscent of the aerial school sighting that would take place in 94, where a bunch of school kids saw a cigar-shaped something with a domed top and a humanoid figure. At another time, multiple Broadhaven residents witnessed bright, anomalous, fiery lights moving laterally across the bay water until they disappeared. 
five miles away. In Herbranston, Maureen Dider saw a cylindrical object equipped with lights moving across the sky so fast it was gone in mere seconds. She barely had a chance to register what it was she was seeing, but that's the description. That is what she saw. In Little Haven, Dorothy Kale witnessed a flash of light that lit up her entire village, followed by the brightest light she had ever seen in her life that looked encased in a glass dome before it flashed brightly and completely disappeared. And of course, we cannot forget about Britain's Roswell. But a mere couple of miles south of Bentwaters is Rendlesham Forest. Jerry Harris, a local resident and business owner, was actually the first witness that night. Claimed to have been driving home when he saw multiple lights zipping around erratically over the forest before diving into the trees, re-emerging, and shooting up into the sky. And then, of course, the rest of the Rendlesham story would go on to play out over the remainder of the evening. But yeah, what what is going on over there? (laughs) And... um, Another avenue of thought was, okay, what is linking all of the, all of this area together? You know, is, is, is there anything of importance for all of these locations? Well, it's interesting to note the amount of military bases in close proximity to all of these events. Um, it's interesting to note that nuclear weapons were stored in some of these bases. You know, is it, is it a nuclear connection? Malmstrom? Hello, Um, Roswell Army Airfield in 1947. They were home to the world's only atomic bomber squadron at the time. Weird. You know, there have been some really extraordinary encounters reported around nuclear weapons and sites. Or maybe it's just a military connection. Uh, To hear Ryan Graves tell it, military pilots are seeing unexplainable things, sometimes on the daily. Um, Ryan Graves is hosting a podcast right now. It's really good. It's called Merged. Check it out. But yeah, uh, military connection is something to think about. And ultimately, uh, isn't that the only reason that certain players in our government even give a crap about the UFO issue? Because military personnel re- are reporting these things. They, they certainly don't give a flying saucer about your Uncle Harry sighting? No, it's because highly trained, grounded, reliable military members are saying they are seeing things that they cannot explain. Um, they cannot shoot down. They cannot catch up to. At least I think that's why they care. <laughs> so there's something there, man. Uh, that's a wrap. That's it. Let's do a final note. Past reports of UAPs have now been analyzed and reassessed by groups and organizations like Arrow. They have been able to identify more and more previously unexplained objects as something quite a bit more rational, such as Chinese spy balloons or drones being used for surveillance. And this is not some shocking surprise. Like, we, we know <laughs> that, um, that a bunch of the unexplainables are explainable. We know that. But there are some past reports that aren't. They include details such as unusual flight characteristics, um, unusual performance capabilities, unique technological capabilities. This should concern anyone enough to want to study these sightings to be curious as to their origin before just writing them off. A report released in 2021 indicated ODNI was investigating 143 unexplained instances of UAP that had taken place between 2004 and 2021, 18 of which were polled for demonstrating technological know-how unknown to the United States, such as objects moving without observable propulsion or with rapid acceleration. Distinct capabilities and attributes believed to be beyond the capabilities also of Russia, China, or anyone else. Think back to the Chinese balloon. We saw it 
We identified it. We shot it down. Piece of cake. Took a minute to do so, but (laughs) we already knew what it was. Because it was a friggin' balloon. Hard to miss. See, the really intriguing stories like Nimitz, like Roosevelt, part of the reason they are so intriguing uh, is because we don't expect trained military members, and, and so many of them, to misidentify something so identifiable, like a balloon, or even like a drone. Our intel is pretty good. Um, I, I think these pilots are trained to know what even the newest drones might look like. Um, and if you've got a story like Nimitz, where the people involved had a good amount of time to visually study it, to interact with it, my gut tells me they'd, they'd be able to place it. And then we've got incidents like Lake and Heath. Give or take your choice of the numerous details and events that took place that night, uh, it, it's, it's still an intriguing story. Let's add another layer to the intrigue. Not only were these trained and accountable military members as well, ground control, air traffic control, jet pilots, radar operators, not only would we expect they too should be able to readily identify something that one would think should be a familiar sight to them, but it took place in 1956. These weren't drones giving off echoes larger than a B-36 or moving at 4,000 miles per hour or appearing and and disappearing off of radars or chasing jets, (laughs) diving and circling and trying to evade it. Sure as heck wasn't a balloon. And we already ruled out anomalous propagation and meteors. So what was it? And if we completely take out the eyewitness accounts out of the story, completely take the pilots out of the story, just consider the radar activity. Multiple radars, different systems, separate locations, picking up the same anomalies. That anomalies were first spotted in Bentwaters, and after they were seen heading towards Lake and Heath, were then picked up on Lake and Heath equipment, thus picking up right where Bentwaters left off. That that in itself is is profound. We can anomalous propagation and false echo and ground clutter all we want, but something was seen on Bentwaters' radars, moved off their scopes towards Lake and Heath, and then began taking place on Lake and Heath radars the rest of the night. Or... It was just a totally bizarre but explainable coincidence with really good timing. Did anyone else feel bad for the little UFO that was chasing the jet back to Water Beach and then just stopped as the pilot continued on? It's like, oh, he just won't play. <laughs> that's, that's another thought that I had. Uh, that's all I got. Weird stuff, man. If you have anything to add to this discussion, hit me up on the socials at ParanormGirlPod or shoot me an email, ParanormGirlPod at gmail.com. Rate, review, and subscribe wherever you are tuning in. Same goes for you on YouTube. Hit that thumbs up, subscribe, and if you hit the little bell icon when you subscribe, you'll be notified every time an episode drops. So you won't have to search and you won't miss a thing. All for now. I will see you guys back here next week. In the meantime, stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.